Snap Judgment Studios. Get a behind-the-scenes look at Comedy Central's The Daily Show on Beyond the Scenes, an original podcast from The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. Every week, host Roy Wood Jr. goes deeper with notable guests and experts from the Emmy Award-winning series, and together, they use comedy to tackle current topics, from gentrification to gun laws, and take a closer look at how and why these topics matter. Listen to Beyond the Scenes from The Daily Show with Trevor Noah on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. New episodes every Tuesday. Snappers, it's your boy Glenn Washington. And for this episode of Snap, we're going to mix things up. Instead of several distinct stories, we're going to stick with just one. But this true tale spans four countries, five decades, and goes places that I still can't wrap my head around. I believe the word is epic. We're calling it Return to Kaku Island. We begin in 1970s Vietnam when Karina Huang was just a teenager. Our own Liz Mack takes it from here. Snap Judgment. Growing up the daughter of a lieutenant colonel in Vietnam, Karina Huang had it all. Oh, yes. <laughs> I even had our nanny to wash my hair for me. I had long hair. I never had to wash my own hair. We have um, a cook to cook for us. We have cleaners to clean the house. We have a driver to drive us around. We have a gardener who lives in the house to look after our garden for us. It was quite a, a um, privileged life that we had lived. To go from having a civilized lifestyle into the jungle, um, it was hard. And then there's nothing can prepare us for that. This was the early 1970s, and you probably know what happens. The Vietnam War, and then the North Vietnamese took over the country and imposed communist rule. People were leaving the country by the tens of thousands. But not Karina's family. Her dad was in prison, and her mom had to take care of the youngest kids in the family. So they found a way for Karina, her 12-year-old brother Saigon, and her 10-year-old sister Mimi to escape. So when she was just 16, Karina led Saigon and Mimi onto a boat. It was 1979. It was packed with people. We sat with knees to our chin. There was no room to move around or stress your legs. Not even the captain knew where the boat would end up. Everyone just knew they were all getting out of Vietnam. Karina and her siblings spent the next week at sea at the bottom of a ship packed with 373 passengers. It was harrowing. That first night, there was a violent storm. Uh, at one point, everybody thought, that's it, we're all going to die. Um, and people started to throw up on each other and relief on each other and scream and cried and pray, called out to Jesus, Virgin Mary, Buddha, ancestors, you name it, that sound. It's just playing in my head like a, a song. And I just pray along with everybody else. Please save us over and over and over again. Karina thinks it was the third day when they saw land. Malaysia. She says as they headed to shore, military men intercepted their boat. And um, they went on our boat to take our valuables. She had her mother's jewelry sewn into her underclothes, but her brother wore a gold necklace. One of the men saw it and put a gun to his neck. I kept saying to him, um, literally begging him, I kept saying, đừng bắn, đừng bắn, đừng bắn, đừng bắn means don't shoot. And I gave him the gold necklace. And then they tow our boat to their boat. They pull us back to the ocean. They cut the rope and left but they want us not to return to Malaysia. Turned away, they ran out of food and drinking water, and people began to die. On day eight, they saw Indonesia. When they got close to shore, everyone jumped off the boat. The captain sank it, 
so no one could push them back. But Indonesia was overwhelmed with Vietnamese refugees. So while officials told them they could stay, they also said they would move everyone to a refugee camp. For Karina, that meant she and her siblings could finally stop running and be taken care of. So the three of them climbed aboard one last boat. The boat trip was long. It was hours until we got to the, this island. And from a distance, we looked and we saw this half moon shaped island with nice sand beach and trees. And then as it come closer, the captains turned around. We were told to swim into the shore. So everybody get off the boat with all our belongings and swim into the shore, all soaking wet. We just spread out on the sand beach. And we looked around. It was a jungle. We didn't see any shelters, any huts, or any camp. It was just an, an island with trees and bushes. And in front of us was the ocean. That's not a refugee camp. The island was completely deserted. There were no buildings, no paths, no sign of human life at all. It was completely wild. And after we disembarked, the boat just took off. So we sat there for hours and wondering what happened. And then the night fell very quickly. There was a heavy storm that came down that night. Karina, Mimi, and Saigon slept on the beach in the pouring rain. When they woke up the next day, they waited on the sand, still in their wet clothes. They were scared of the jungle behind them and what animals might be in it. They couldn't go forward into the endless sea in front of them. So, trapped on the beach, Karina kept an eye out for the boat. She thought it would come back. Everyone did. No one came back, no words from anyone, no sign of any boats around us. By the third day, people started to realize that maybe this is where we're going to be staying. The name of the island was Kuku. It's spelled K-U-K-U. It was actually Kuku Beach, just a section of the coast on the larger Jamaja Island. But when you're stranded on a beach, on an island, in the middle of the ocean with jungle all around you and no way of getting around, that beach is pretty much the only thing you know. So they called it Kaku Island. On Kaku, there were no tools, no food reserves, no toilets. The refugees only had the things they'd brought with them. And those were the things they had to help them survive. The, the people that were on that boat, they were not farmers. They were intellectual people, business people, tradesmen. They had no idea how to live off the land. There were a lot of coconut trees, but... We can't climb up the trees to get the coconuts. And also, we got them down. We didn't have knives or anything to chop the coconut with. I'm not a good swimmer, so I was scared of swim out there to, to, to catch anything. I couldn't fish or hunt. I didn't have any tools. I was scared of snakes and animals. I was afraid of going to the jungle. But some people did venture into the jungle. And that's where they found a creek. Although food was still scarce. So in the beginning, Karina and her siblings lived off the supplies they had brought with them. At first, we lived on the ramen noodles. Every day, Karina would open up a packet of ramen and break it into four corners. And for one meal, the three of them all together would share one corner of the packet. They'd boil it in salt water until it expanded, trying to make the most of what little they had. We tried to save them and eat very frugally, a little bit at a time, just to keep us alive. We saw a boat that came toward the shore. We were so excited. We thought, oh my God, they finally came for us. But it turned out to be another boat of refugees like us. More and more Vietnamese boat people kept arriving on that island. Even though they were in the middle of nowhere, they weren't the only ones. Indigenous fishermen from the other islands found them on their small boats. They offered to trade fish and vegetables and tools for whatever jewelry the refugees had left. And using those tools, they started to build shelter. 
and then they went to the jungle and chopped down trees and branches and leaves to make huts with. But shelter wasn't enough. Soon, disease began to spread. When we had to go to the bathroom, we just went to the ocean. But then soon, uh, we realized that that just not safe and clean. Their waste would wash back up on shore. That's when people went up to the jungle instead. And that created the problem of flies. We called it Fly Island. Flies everywhere. Sometimes when we lay down and take a nap in the afternoon, we could be covered by fly from head to toe, pitch black. It spread the disease much wider and faster. Very quickly, people caught malaria and diarrhea. Um, people started to die on that island after day number 10. We um, became dehydrated and because we didn't have enough to eat or drink, our body just shrunk very quickly. And um, there were a period where all I did every day was just try to find something to eat and then take care of um, our diarrhea situation. Karina would spend her day cleaning and emptying this one bucket of waste, taking it to the ocean to clean, bringing it back for her brother and sister to use, and then taking it out to clean again. When you have this kind of routine every day, do you ever kind of reach some kind of equilibrium? Where it's like, well, this is normal. It's never normal. In those first few days, Karina saw an eight-month-old baby die. When she first died, her body was still warm. And I washed her and put clothes on her, and she started to get colder and stiff. The man, I didn't know where he got the tool, but he found some wood, and he made a box for her. And I lined up that box with um, some plastic bags that the parents had and um, her clothes to make it soft and comfortable for her. And then I put it in the box, and she lay there like a doll. We haven't been eating for a couple of days, very little drinking water. My sister and my brother just lay there like dead bodies. They just whisper and they said, I'm so thirsty, I'm so hungry and so weak. Many times I thought we're not going to make it. But for some reason, I was so um, determined that no matter what, I will not die before my sister and my brother because I need to stay alive to look after them. Sometimes I picture my sister and my brother, these two little kids, so weak and vulnerable and alone to bury me, especially when I see people die around me. For months, everyone on that island kept wondering would anyone from the outside world ever know we were here that would come and rescue us? As they grew weaker and weaker, they still managed to hang on. They survived on fish and lizards and whatever else they could hunt. They made slingshots to pelt bats with. So they survived for one month, two months, then three. And one day we heard the sound of a helicopter, and we look up and there was a helicopter with a sign of Red Cross um, flying around. And people were jumping up and down, screamed and just waved. And it's, it's almost like um, you have had a drought for so long and then all of a sudden rain came down and everybody looked up and just tried to, you know, taste that water and, and take it in. And the next day there was a ship came in with medicines and with cabbage and fresh tuna. And that's when we knew that um, we will be okay. People found us now. We will, we will be okay. And uh, we survived, all three of us. Karina, Saigon, and Mimi stayed on the island for five more months. And during that time, Kaku started to become the refugee camp everyone had expected in the very beginning. Finally, they had food to eat. They had blankets. They had papers and plans to resettle to America. You've asked me what it was like the day I left Google. 
We each had a bag of our belonging um, that we carry with us. Then we went to the pier, and um, our friends would come to say goodbye, or I would run around the island try to find people that I know to say goodbye to them. We were jumping up and down, say, "We gotta go! We gotta go! We're going to America! We're leaving now!" I was just just um, happy that we finally got out of there. I was just happy that I get to leave Google. Now that they had survived, they could move on. The thing is, once you've come this close to dying on an island, you never can really leave it behind. Did you ever think, I have unfinished business, you know, like something will bring me back? No, I never thought I would ever see Gugu again or desire to. Life after Kaku Island. When Snap Judgment returns, stay tuned. Attention shoppers, we now have taste in the bread aisle. Dave's Killer Bread. That's right. An organic bread that's no longer a sedative for your taste buds. Dave's Killer Bread is on a mission to make the most of the loaf. To rid the world of GMOs, high fructose corn syrup, and artificial ingredients. And plant the seeds of good in all that they bake. Killer taste. Killer texture. Always organic. Dave's Killer Bread. Bread. Amplified. You're listening to Snap Judgment. When last we left, after Karina Huang and her siblings were rescued from Kaku Island, Karina thought she would never, ever go back. Karina, Saigon, and Mimi still talked about Kaku, even after they were settled in the U.S. Mostly, they talked about how relieved they were that it was over. And then, more than a decade later, Karina reunited with her aunt, who had also fled Vietnam. I I went to uh, visit my aunt, and she prepared this meal, and she set up a table. So one, two, three, four, four of us. But she set up five settings, and um, she pointed a, a set of bow and chopsticks and, and napkin next to me, and she said, were well, you very close to him, so you sit next to him. And I thought, we have a guest. And I said, who? Who is he? And then she said, you know, your cousin Jung, who died. And that shocked me. After escaping Vietnam, Karina's aunt, her cousin Jung, and the rest of their family had also been stuck on an island in Indonesia. It was called Terempa, not far from Kuku. And that's where Jung died. So she was never happy again. I did not realize that she set up, you know, a a bow and pair of chopsticks for him every meal. I started to recognize her pain that was a lot deeper than than I was aware of. It wasn't just the pain any mother feels after losing a child, but she also felt this guilt that she was never able to give him a proper burial. So I just, out of the blue, said to her, I'm going to go back to Indonesia and try to find his grave someday. And she looked at me like, yeah, right, you're going to the moon someday, you said? But Karina meant what she said. Although when she googled Kaku or Taremba, she came up with nothing. No matter where she looked, she couldn't find any information on the islands, let alone how to get to them. So in the summer of 1998, almost 20 years since she'd left Kaku, she crossed her fingers and flew to Singapore. She went with her younger brother Saigon and her cousin, Jung's brother. These islands were so remote that even when they visited the Indonesian consulate, officials there told them they had no idea they even existed, never mind how to get to them. But then one of the ladies who worked there, and she overheard the conversation, and she came out from her office, and she said, I knew that when the Vietnamese refugees arrived, they stay in an area called Anambas. And Anambas has a group of islands. The woman was right. Trumpa was one of those islands. And Karina actually managed to get all of them on a Navy boat, which dropped them off on Trumpa. 
But even once they landed on the island, they still had no idea where to find their cousin's grave. And then they found a farmer who said he knew the way. When we came upon this site that the farmer was so adamant that there were graves in that um, area, but with naked eyes, we couldn't see anything but thick bushes and trees. So we cleared the area and sure enough, we saw eight graves on the ground and they all were just rock formations. None of them have tombstones or names or marks. Karina had no idea if their cousin's body was even among these graves. So I told my cousin and my brother, I said, why don't we three just focus and pray to our cousin and ask him for his spirits to guide us. So we went separate way, contemplate, focus and pray. And we turned around and um, uh, the three of us just pointed at the same grave. So I said, okay, it's a start. Let's do it. Karina wanted to excavate the body, even though they couldn't be sure it was the right one. But there were rules. And she was told, once you dig up a body, you can't put it back. So Karina knew she only had one shot. My aunt told me before I left, there are two things that would help me to identify his grave. So she said um, he, his body was put inside of a wooden box, a coffin. And also she said she wrapped his body in a military poncho that was belonged to his father. So after a long time digging, and then we all heard the sound of the shovel hit something that made a big sound, but it also bounced the shovel back. It was this dead silence. Everybody looked down to this, this um, grave, and the guy continued to dig faster, and we saw pieces of wood. And... Um, and I couldn't believe it. I remember I held my hands really, really tight because I was shaking. To me, the three of us just held hands and stood there and watched. And then um, after the, the wood and the dirt, and it started to reveal um, some the material that looks like a military canvas. So we pulled up this long poncho with the body inside. And on top of that, there were clothes that my aunt buried for him, and my younger cousin recognized that. There was his brother's jeans and shirts and a raincoat and a pack of underwear. But I just could not believe that we found a grave. So, yeah, it's, it's just, I cannot describe that feeling to you. Karina and her brother and cousin cremated Jung's body there in the jungle. They took his ashes to Vietnam and put him to rest with the remains of his family members. Then she told her aunt what they had done. Before, she always had this um, embitter, you know, look. Um, But now she's just so content. That stuck with her. She started to talk about her trip to friends and family members. She even made a website, kind of as a way to tell people, I found my way back to these islands and you can too. But I never, ever thought that it would be me who had taken families back to this jungle to find the, the graves of their loved ones. It was never in my mind. But then Karina started to get messages from people who wanted to find the graves of the family members they'd left on Cuckoo. And they wanted Karina to take them back. At first, she was reluctant. She knew how difficult it would be to arrange these trips, that it would mean months and months of preparation. But after a year, she decided she couldn't say no anymore. She agreed to take one trip back to Cuckoo Island. And that led to a second, a third, and then that turned into seven. In total, she's helped about 15 families find the graves of their loved ones. I got in touch with Karina about a year ago, when we sat down for our first interview. That's when I asked if she had any trips coming up, and if I could come along. And Karina said yes, but she told me she can't do this much longer. It's been 10 years almost since I returned. And after so many trips, I I felt draining. It's it's time for me to stop. So, yes, this will be my last trip. 
back to Gugu Island. Karina's last trip to Kaku Island. When we return, stay tuned. From WNYC Studios, welcome back to Snap Judgment, Return to Kaku Island. My name is Glenn Washington, and today we're taking the unusual step of spending our entire episode covering one story. And when last we left, Karina Huang was headed back one last time Kaku Island. Producer Liz Matt takes us there with her. Oh, this way, this way. <laughs> hey, this way. <laughs> Tell me where we're going right now. What are we doing? We're going to go to Kuku. We're going to go to Kuku Island uh, to uh, uh, find my father's remains and grave. How do you feel right now? Well, oh, I'm feeling anxious. Okay. I. I hope I recognize Kuku, that the way it was, we'll see. But it will be interesting. It will be interesting that um, you know, I'm going back to the place that I left 39 years ago. Yes. This is Tony Liu, easily the most eager person in our group. He's here with his 77-year-old mom, Drung An. She's holding onto her other son Daniel's arm as they follow Karina down the dock. Thank you, Ula. She's happy. Uh, she's, she's happy. Two days ago, we all met in Singapore. Since then, we've taken a boat, a plane, and two more boats. We're about to start the last leg of this trip. One more boat to Cuckoo Island. Tony was only 18 when he said goodbye to Cuckoo and left his father behind in a shallow grave. Now he's almost 60. He tells me that in all this time, he's never talked to a single person about what happened there or about his dad's death. No, uh, he was the greatest man I ever knew. I never thought he could die. And so I never want to talk about it again. I never want to even remember about it. And I try to learn how to forget. For Tony, Kaku was the place that broke his family. And he never wanted to come back. But I know I have to do this. It's just me that I feel like I don't have the courage. Don't I have the bravery. That bother me. He always worried about me. Always. Yeah. I'll tell you a story of <coughs> how he worry about me. Uh, I was the reason why he died. Tony says his dad never had to leave Vietnam. The house was all paid for, and he had enough money to live out the rest of his life comfortably. But Tony was 18, and his parents worried that because of his age, he would be forcibly enlisted. They would send me to the labor camp, or they would make me join the army. He decided to live because of my future. On this boat, there's the Liu family, and Karina, of course. There's Karina's 18-year-old daughter, who's coming to Kaku for the very first time. Then there's another man, who's come back for the second time, to visit his mother's grave. As we cross through the same ocean Tony crossed back in 1979, the memories start to come back. One dark night on the open water, he says he saw a light. You know, I have never seen anything more beautiful structure than that. It's just like a, uh, a high rise building on the sea. It was an offshore drilling rig, marked by Indonesian flags. And I remember some workers shouted out, Refugee! At that moment I realized, oh my god, I'm a refugee. <laughs> you know, that was a very strange uh, 
you know, I and four days ago I was a was a citizen, a young man in the city. Now you suddenly become a refugee. Soon, Tony and his family were on Cuckoo Island. This is it. On this little sand beach you see here. This is it. Cuckoo Island. As we pull up, it's everything Tony and Karina said it would be. Gorgeous. Unreal. Eerily pristine. There's palm trees that sway back and forth. The clearest water. But the jungle looms over us. It's, it's like Jurassic Park. Ever since we saw Cuckoo in the distance, and even now as we step onto the sand, Karina has been crying. So now that I'm standing here, I really don't know how we survive. It's a miracle. Look at this. this no one in the outside world would know we are in here. It's nothing but bushes and trees and jungles. Yeah, that's how we, how we came in. That's how the condition pretty much were like. Yeah. Um, you were both here the same year. Oh, actually, we some month. Same month. month. We were and, a few days apart. Yes. How do you feel right now? Hmm? How do you feel right now? Exciting. Yeah. yeah. But this is amazing. Uh, this is where I just can't believe this is where I was. I hate to say this, but I don't recognize much. Does that make you sad? Yes. It can be very sad. Because, you know, there were so much memories. I hope I could find more. Maybe it's just now. We burn an offering of paper money at the point where the beach meets the jungle. It's a way to pay respects to the spirits and to ask for their blessing as we look for their graves. Then Karina, with Mrs. Liu, tells me it's time. So now we are going to go to the creek, the area where she buried her husband. You ask her how she feels? She's very anxious, and she hopes that she will find him. Yeah. I asked if she's ready. She said yes. She's ready to go. Tony? Yeah. We're going to the Okay. Yes, I'm ready. When I get a chance to sit with Tony alone, there's still one thing we haven't broached. Can you tell me about... Um... Can you tell me about how your dad passed? Now his illness started and killed him within three days. And the last day, he's already in coma. Tony says the whole thing was sudden. We have some doctor on the island, but none of them have medicine. When a doctor came to check on his father, he thought it was malaria. And then he said, there's no hope. You know, uh... What the hardest thing for me to, to witness. And the doctor was at his side too, as my father was gasping for air. As his father gasped for air, the doctor said, we have to stop his suffering. So he put his hand over on my father's nose and mouth to cover, so my father could go. I hope nobody remembered that but me. We're walking along the beach, with the waves catching our feet. It's funny because it's just like the most idyllic beach resort type sand. Then the sand gives way to high grass. We walk further away from the beach into a wall of trees and green where the real wilderness begins. We're heading into the jungle. And then, we reach the creek. Uh, this water creek right here is the only source of drinking water for thousands of us refugees when we were here. We would come here to get some drinking water, um, and we also wash our clothes here. Um, this is the source of life for all of us when we were here. And that's how we live. Tony, you remember that? Mac just told me... The creek is knee-high. We don't know how Tony's 77-year-old mom is going to get across. Karina brought some local men with machetes and shovels 
And now they're starting to gather fallen branches. So can you see what they're doing right now? <laughs> I think they try to build the, 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 the bridge so we can cross. Uh, but I'm surprised that they're attempting to do this because we only have, you know, we don't have that much time. It's late afternoon, and we only have a few hours before we have to leave and take the boat back. I'm not sure that she can cross it, but I, I, you know, uh, if she have to walk through the water, it's all right. You think she'll do it no matter what? Oh, yes, she'll do that no matter what. I know that. This is the easy part. So people are kind of like tightrope walking on this pretty thin log. It's actually pretty precarious. That's when Tony's mom decides to cross. She's doing it. She's doing it. Yes, yes. The further she goes along, the more and more this makeshift bridge sinks lower and lower into the creek. And then... What are they doing? They carry my mother across the creek. Yeah, that's the best way, probably. Two men hoist her up, one by her feet, one by her shoulders, and carry her the rest of the way. We follow after. Okay, be careful. Why do you need to empty water from your shoes? <laughs> it's okay. Socks have absorbed it. We just climbed out of the creek and are walking through dirt and mud and rocks, bending under low hanging branches. Tree roots pop up out of nowhere. Oh, be careful. So we keep our eyes to the ground. Oh, by, way, by the way, we didn't have shoes. Shoe was a real luxury, right? <laughs> Liz, only a few meters up there, there will be graves. And her, her husband's grave will be among there, if he's, if he's still there. And then, we're there. So we're just, we came upon this clearing and there's and a bunch of tombstones. Can you just see what we're walking into? We are walking to, you know, to the cemetery grounds of, uh, of the Kuku Island. This is the very first grave on Kuku Island that we found and excavated. And this is the start of everything else. David Lee was going to Some of the grave sites have large but basic concrete tombs built over them. These are the graves of people whose families have come with Karina and found them. And then there are the graves no one has come back for. It's hard to know exactly what we're looking at. Large rocks are scattered on the ground, and it's unclear which of them are grave markers and which are just rocks. Uh, yes. Today, searching for Tony's dad, this will be the last grave on Kaku that Karina ever looks for. Uh-huh. Okay, do you remember approximately where? Just take some time. Okay. Just to, to now think and try to remember where about. Tony was the one who chose the rock back when he was 18. He remembers he was looking for a big one and that it was triangular with rounded edges. We all are going to wait. Please have the men clear all the leaves on the side so that we can find a grave. It's in this area. Okay? No. No. Yes, please. So uh, if they can just clear all the leaves. To clear all the leaves? To clear, yeah. She just wants to find the rocks. Oh, like find the rocks. Yes. Oh. Oh. When the leaves and debris and dirt obscuring the grave sites are cleared, the Liu start to look for their father. And I think it looks like Karina's pointing to different rocks and asking, um, you know, their mom is, do you recognize this rock? Uh, just seems like after 40 years to remember the rock and the specific place where someone was buried, it would just be so difficult. That looks too big, yeah? That's for sure. Too big? Yeah. Tony, do you think this is the one? Uh, the ship, like the, what, we, what we remember, but I'm not sure it's the one or not. Yeah, when I asked mom, she said it's on this side, not on that side. And she said that looks like it, but you don't know if it's still that memory. So she thinks it's the one. 
thinking right now. And then Karina takes Mrs. Liu's necklace and dangles it in the air. She's using it as a pendulum, a kind of tool to try to speak to Tony's dad directly. She says in the past, the spirits of the dead have helped her find their own graves. She starts asking questions out loud. What did she ask? So, is, is that... The question was, is his spirit here with us right now? Very strong. Yeah. The, 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 the pendulum is shaking very, very strongly. Um, it's an indication that he's here. Um, and then Tony chimes in. Remember what I told you? The piece of rock was kind of round and triangle looking. Does it look like to you? Yeah. It does. I placed that rock. You feel certain this is the one? Well, certain is not, never can be hundred certain, but I feel very strongly, yeah. The rock is big enough to hold in both your hands. It's sitting in a dirt clearing in this jungle on an island in the middle of the ocean. It's both momentous, and at the same time, it looks so forlorn. You can't get out, you can't get out, you can't get out. Tony's mom told me earlier that she's wanted to take care of her husband's grave for 40 years. It's tradition. And now she finally has her chance. She washes the rock, then she burns sticks of incense, planting them in the dirt. Each of the brothers has a moment alone with their father. Tony breaks down and sobs. Karina stands back and watches. And then I ask her this. Can I ask you when we, when they decided, when they, you know, confirmed, I think this is the one, you, you started to cry. What, what were you feeling? Um, I, I, I think this is the one. I felt it in my heart. And I am very glad that he's here to help us. Um, so I'm happy. It's a happy tears. It really is. But those happy tears are brief. Yeah. I'm sad to see it. <laughs> How sad the grave looks. That's what left of a life. He was the man of the family. He brought his wife and children here. And that's all he had. It's <laughs> fine. It's fine. Well, I hope you're happy that your wife and your children are here with you today. Before dark, we turn back. We carry Tony's mom across the creek, walk out of the jungle, through the high grass, across the beach, and climb back up on the boat. The next day, back at the guest house, I was talking with Tony and asked how he felt now that he'd finally found his dad. Silly me. <laughs> I want to ask him why you have to die. Yeah. I know that our family is in a better situation than you know, average, so we're lucky in, in a sense. But we would have a perfect <laughs> sometimes I'm thinking back if we knew how expensive 
of what the price we have to pay, will, will we still make the same decision? Maybe not. In fact, we were able to come back to, to this island to see him. It is a, a miracle. But I would never, never forget the fact that what if, what if? So this is my last question. I I was actually really, um, I found it just really, really interesting that you seem to have like affection for Cuckoo. It sounded like you found the beauty in something that I find so brutal. Mm. Yeah. I get, I get it. I get it. And it's true. I have this um, attachment to it. I have a sense of appreciation and love for it and, and, and afraid of it at the same time. It's like I couldn't wait to get away from it, but not because I hate it. Actually, as, as awful as it was and fearful, it's actually um, um, saved my life, you know? I could have died at sea. So when we were on that island, we were on land. And that little island actually protected us from the angry seas and the storms, the pirates. Do you ever miss Cuckoo? Yes, of course. Um, I miss the calmness of the ocean sometimes. I miss the beautiful clear water. Um, I miss some moments when I just sat there and be very afraid and felt very alone. I miss the nights when um, I look up in the sky and there was millions and trillions of stars that were so beautiful. I miss the night when it was so um, cold and wet, heavy rain throughout the night, and when we had nowhere to hide. It's crazy, but I miss those moments too. Why? I guess it was just so strong. Strong emotions, strong feelings, strong fears. It was real. It was different than what I've ever experienced before and after. I don't know. I I like I like the way you combine brutal and beauty together. Yeah. That's cuckoo for you. Mhm. Mm Painfully good. Thank you so much to Karina Huang. And check out her book, Boat People, Personal Stories from the Vietnamese Exodus. It's available in both English and Vietnamese. And if that is not enough, Karina is now starring in a new Australian Broadcasting Corporation TV series, The Heights. Be sure to check it out. And huge, warm thanks to Tony Liu, his mother, Drung On, his brother Daniel, and the rest of the Liu family. Thanks as well for the Outside Podcast from Outside Magazine. You can also hear this episode. Get this podcast where you get your podcast. Also check Public Radio International's The World for a shorter version of this audio story, as well as text and photo coverage. And last but not least, this story would not have been possible without the generous support of the International Women's Media Foundation. Thank you for helping us make stories that matter. We'll have links to all the above and images from Cuckoo Island on our website, snapjudgment.org. The original score for that story was by Renzo Gorio. It was produced by Liz Mack. It's that time. But Glenn, I need more amazing storytelling. Can you help me? 
Why, yes, friend, I certainly can. Just subscribe to the amazing Snap Judgment Storytelling Podcast, where there are days of incredible storytelling awaiting your pleasure. However you get your podcast, get this one. Snapjudgment.org. Snap Judgment was brought to you by the team that always brings their A-game. Please, garlands and roses for the Uber producer, Mr. Mark Ristich. The thriller, Pat Masidi Miller. Rustlin, Anna Sussman. Liz on the attack, Mac. I'm peeping. Adiza Egan. Nancy Very Fancy Lopez. Dance like Erica Lance. No Deal, John Facile. Neon, Leon, Morimocho. Renzo the Benzo Gorio. A fifth with Eliza Smith. That's kind of a sister rhyme. Tail. Dick's Vegan Mayo. The cop. And no real words rhyme with Jasmine Aguilera. And even though this is not the news, no way this is the news. In fact, you could go through life being shunned by all the other cats. Not really wanting to chase mice or balls of string. Wonder what's happening until you hear yourself say woof. And everything falls into place. And you would still, still not be as far away from the news as this is. But this is WNYC.